All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third uh, webinar regarding the uh, zoning for uh, Hope Elementary School. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, before I do that, I will want to make some introductions with, with me tonight is Dr. Debbie Phillips, our Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Education, and Mr. Chris McCord, our Executive Director of Operations, and Sarah Blakelock, our Director of Communications, who is um, and probably off camera right now. We'll go ahead and get started and I'll share my screen. So hopefully you are seeing the screen okay. Um, as a, again, we wanna present information about this. If you've been the other um, webinars, we're gonna probably repeat some information just in case it's the first time to view. So just to kind of take you through um, and catch everybody up. Bennett School District is gonna be opening a 950 uh, student elementary school and this will open in the fall of 2021 that's in August it is Ruben W Hope Junior Elementary it's going to serve students in pre-k through grade four it is located at 14755 Granger Pines Way and that's in the Granger Pines development which is a new community there along 3083 and just to to the location and hopefully you can see my cursor just to get you in this is actually where um, element uh, Grangerland are and so if you continue down 3083 this is the pines development I apologize it's an older picture there's a lot more houses in there now um, this is a rendering of what the new school will look like and construction is well underway in fact, we've made a lot of progress and pretty much uh, at the point now where they're able to work inside. This gives you kind of a view of the orientation of, towards the neighborhood and then you can see where the homes are have come in in the background. It's a different angle. So just to, you know, why are we opening a new elementary in this area? Well, the most common reason that we open an elementary school and have to go through the process of adjusting attendance boundaries is that we open a new school and that's due to growth. Um, the district is growing. Um, you know, sometimes over time we see that areas might grow and other areas shrink. And so we sometimes have to do some rezoning for shifting of uh, density. Sometimes areas will age up and uh, other times they just kind of get renewal. So uh, we have to respond to changes in patterns. But, um, this, this really is a campus that's being built to deal with our current crowding at some campuses as well as anticipated growth in the area. Uh, as of December 3rd, our enrollment was 64,700 in the district, and we ended last year at 64,450 students. So we've grown a little bit, only you know, roughly 300 students since last year. Normally, we grow anywhere from 1,200 to 1,400 a year. And so with the year of the pandemic, we've seen some changes in enrollment. So and we didn't we haven't grown as quickly and, and would note that in some cases our schools this year the same size or smaller or just a little bit bigger than where they were last year so uh, this has been an interesting year as far as growth so why we begin this process you know austin elementary school has a capacity of roughly 900 students it ended 2020 with an enrollment of 1020 students um, and it currently utilizes 11 portable classrooms in 2028, Austin is projected at 1,551 students. So that's an area under current zone is going to grow rapidly. And Creighton Elementary is another campus that is overcrowded and also expected to grow. Um, it, it currently has a capacity of 675 students and in, in the last year with enrollment of 815 students and they have 10 portable classrooms. In 2028, it is projected to have an enrollment of 1,058. Uh, in addition, San Jacinto Elementary, which uh, concluded 2020 with 620 students has a capacity of roughly 750 students. In 2028 is projected to have an enrollment of almost 1,300 students. So a lot of growth um, good for the San Jacinto area. In Patterson uh, Elementary, which is actually in the Conroe feeder, uh, is actually a part of this rezoning discussion and we'll talk more about it. And uh, it finished 2020 with 950 students with a capacity of 925 students and it has classroom. So just to kind of give everybody a little bit of an orientation, this is our current zoning map for East County. And this this area, the Caney feeder, 
um, is not part of Caney Creek Feeder. It previously went to Austin Elementary, and we just kind of made a note there, but it now goes to Patterson and then on to Bosman and Stockton and Conroe High School. And then this area 26C, which is also behind the dark blue line here, which separates really our intermediate feeder or high school feeders. Uh, and so this area 20, 26C is actually uh, currently going to Austin Elementary, but we do we do we did make a note of that as we're going through this process with whether or not that is an area we can include in bringing into the Conroe feeder. So um, we will talk more about that when we present our our plan. And then this is currently just kind of highlighting some of the high growth areas in the uh, in this cane feeder area. So you can kind of see where we know where we have pro uh, developments underway or future developments that will take place in the next in the next few years. One thing I will share about project growth um, is that you know it it is it is that it's a projection and we have found over time that sometimes growth can happen faster and sometimes it can happen slower. So um, we certainly understand that as we look at that. There is a copy of our recent demographic report on our website if you'd like to look and find some more information about that. I'll mention also about geo actual, actual enrollment and what the difference between the two are because when we talk about campus students are there, we're talking about actual enrollment. Uh, however, when we do planning, um, there's a difference between how many actually show up at a school and go to a school versus how many students live in that area. And the reason for that is, is sometimes there are transfers and sometimes there are special programs. And those are mostly the reasons that apply for that. So as an example, uh, a campus where there are teachers who want to bring their children to school with them, so the enrollment will be larger than however many students live in the community because there's, there's other students being added to the enrollment from, for, because of transfers. And the district allows that, so employees can bring their and to work with them and go to that school. Uh, the other reason could be a special program. And so sometimes our programs are offered at every school, sometimes they're offered at some schools. And, and when they're offered at not every school, that work as a satellite where students come over from a nearby area and attend the program at that school. And so sometimes we have enrollment that's a little bit higher. So geocoded just reflects the number of students that actually in an area. And because programs move around and they can be moved and they can change location, when we do planning, we really just focus on geocoded. That is who lives there. So if nobody else went to that, well, how many numbers will it produce when we draw the boundaries? So I just want to prepare you in case you try to understand why is there a difference sometimes in the numbers of who's there now and who might be there in the projection. The rule, I always say, you know, prepare to add, you know, anywhere for an elementary school, 50 to 100 students above whatever we project, just because um, there's usually some transfers. So just giving kind of a quick summary, um, you know, Austin Elementary, Creighton, um, Milam, and San Diego are all part of this feeder, Patterson. And I did share some information about Grangeland and Bosman because as I mentioned, um, we, are gonna, we are facing in the future, there will be some changes in the intermediate, but that's not what we're doing in this process. We're just looking at elementaries. So Austin with a capacity of 911 pools, and currently they're at 966. Um, and we project them uh, by 28 to be at 1,551. Creighton, with a capacity of 675, is currently 115. They have 10 portable classrooms. And so one of our goals is how can we reduce our dependency on uh, temporary classrooms and try to get everybody, as many of our students, inside as possible. Uh, Milam, which is a, one of our newer campuses, has a capacity of roughly 925 students, and they're sitting around 750 students, and they're pretty full. They're a little bit down this year, but they're projected at 910 by 2028. And then finally, San Jacinto Elementary, with a capacity of roughly 750 students, um, is currently at 570, finished last year at 620, and uh, projected to be at 960 by 2025, which will be over capacity, and then by 1296, 1296 by 2028. So you can see that San Jacinto is projected for some rapid growth. Patterson will have some limited growth. Grangerland will experience a lot of the same rapid growth that the other elementaries reflect. And Bosman will also have some growth um, over the next few years. And we'll, and we'll certainly be mindful of that. So what are we trying to accomplish through this process of rezoning? Um, there are some basic goals. Uh, our objective 
to develop an attendance boundary first and foremost to populate our new school. So we want to, when we draw the boundaries, have a group of students that we know will attend Hope Elementary School. And also want to leave a little bit of room there for growth because we know the area that it's in is still going to grow a little bit more. We also want to provide uh, relief for future for future capacity for Austin and Creighton and San Jacinto. Be mindful of that. We want to be mindful of that. Uh, we also are projected to have, and just give you an idea, a little over 4,000 students by 2025. And currently, before we open HOPE, we have 3,250 seats. Once we uh, open HOPE, we will jump up to 4,175 students. So we will have enough capacity to take us uh, through the 2025 year and, and maybe a year beyond that uh, before we again exceed space. As a result, there will be another elementary school coming to this area in the next few years. And so I certainly want to put that out there so we don't have people surprised in a few years when we go through this process again. So we are going to see some rapid growth and we are going to build some schools. The eight-year projection for the Caney Creek Elementary is roughly 4,815 students. So we're going to need that other school in place to get us through uh, up through uh, 2020. So why is this process challenging? We know it's challenging schools are, are communities. And so people have history going to that school, um, communicate, they see each other, they interact with one another. With one another and we understand that. Families often have a history. Uh, sometimes they choose where they live because of a specific school and where they went to school. They want to go to that school. And we understand that. So we don't take this process lightly. We don't want to just move folks around and move them around. So we uh, and the committee understands that. We know when we do change boundaries, routines are disrupted, and we are looking at that. We have. We also realize we have an open elementary school in the Caney Creek feeder in several years, and so um, this is something that people are not to. And um, so, you know, in the next few years, in the next ten years, we're going to see some rapid growth, and we will probably open some schools, and um, this will happen more and more frequently. Um, we will likely have impact many families to achieve our objectives of populating this campus and then re reducing crowding at, uh, to deal with our anticipated growth. So we know that it's one of the challenges in this zoning process that in order to create room at Austin, in order to create room at Creighton, uh, in order to fill up uh, hope or put students at hope, we're going to have to do some dominoing and some shifting of student population. So it's going to impact a lot of folks. Uh, and, and I say that because sometimes when we open a school, we might have a school that's very large or two schools really large that are close and we can open the next school and we can just cut those other schools or you know those students there and we don't impact a large uh, area. In this case we're having to pull from several schools to populate this new school in order to achieve our objectives as well. And, and the geography of where the schools also pro provide some challenges for the committee. So as we go through this we do establish some goals. I want to be mindful of the quality of education and the welfare of our students, and that's our mission. So feel confident about that um, if, if families are moved and we have to attend a new school, that we will provide quality education at that school. And we feel strongly about that. To establish an ABC, and this is something that we've done in attendance boundary committee, that will develop and propose these boundary scenarios. And they will do these scenarios for input. We've had some, we've put them out there, and we will develop and recommend a plan to the Board of Trustees. And so this is our third one of these. And the first one, we talked about the process. The second one, we showed three scenarios that we, after looking at several, narrowed down to. And now in the third, um, the third meeting, what we want to do tonight is show you what our committee is going to recommend. And so we want to certainly show that to you. Um, we want to draw boundaries that makes use of our facilities. Again, it's hard to explain why we have overcrowding at, at one school or another school um, that is largely wide open. So we're having to move students around to take advantage of our space that we will create where we need to, to reduce enrollment. We, all, we want to have reduce enrollment in our overcrowded campuses. We want to plan and allow for future growth as well. Something I will note that we anticipate opening a new elementary in a few years. I've mentioned that already. We also will be opening a larger replacement campus for Moorhead Junior High School in 2023. And so that, that school, which was behind Milam Grangerland uh, complex and uh, on the west side of Andy Creek High School, 
when we open that campus, our plan is to repurpose uh, Moorhead Junior High to an intermediate school. So in 2023, we know we're going to bring another uh, five, six campus online. So we, we know that's coming. So we wanted to plan for that as we went through this process. And then certainly we want to um, share information with the public and, and have some opportunities for feedback. So we began with, and we've been fortunate to have a, uh, uh, an attendance boundary committee that has worked on this process that's made up of uh, principals and parents and some district staff. We've worked on this roughly since September. And as we went, went through the process, um, there have been several considerations that we look at. Um, and these are not in any particular order, but we do look at, you know, what is our campus capacity? What's the input? Uh, we look at demographic factors, feeder pattern, and school history, and that's why I shared up front that we have some areas that go to Austin that transfer back into the Conroe feeder at intermediate school. We look at ge geographical proximity, the location of neighborhoods and communities. Uh, we look at natural boundaries, major roads, thoroughfares, freeways, railroad tracks, those kinds of things, trying to look at possible places to, to put boundaries. Uh, we try to minimize the impact on families. We also are looking at the number of times areas have been recently rezoned or likely to be rezoned in the future. So that's why we had kind of marked that one area on the map because we knew um, that we had rezoned them about three years ago and we were really trying to avoid moving uh, families again. So we, we will not to do that very often. Um, so that is something we are mindful of. We also are trying to be aware where possible future schools would be. You know, we anticipate the next elementary will probably be in the 242 corridor. Again, that's not positive and that's not set in stone, but we're just trying to anticipate where the next campus might be. And knowing that, uh, you know, keeping that in mind is this process. So we know that there's not going to be a, a campus that comes up, say, north of Austin Elementary, then we'll know we have to do more to solve for Austin to give them time uh, during this rezoning process. And so we also want to look at future enrollment predictions and then transportation patterns. To do that, one of the things we look at certainly is some analysis of how far we're going to make people drive or what, how long this ride would be from campus to campus. And so we try to try to gauge that and get an idea once we look at campus options. And, and you know, one of the challenges that we've gone through this process is that um, there are some long rides out there. And, and through the zoning process, there will probably be some rides lengthened, and there'll be probably some that'll be shortened, and there'll be some that'll be roughly the same. And so we, we, we do know that's, that is a reality of this process. We have had three sets. As I mentioned, the first presentation was in October, and the second one in November. And this is our third, and uh, we our last presentation. So certainly we want to um, thank you for those of you that have viewed these. So just to kind of catch everybody up, we, at the last session, we, um, we talked about several scenarios, but we brought forward three that we, we really talked about, 6.4, uh, which was the fourth variation of the six option and seven, and then 7.1. After a lot of review and discussion, our committee has selected scenario seven as the scenario that it wants to bring forward as a recommend, recommendation to our board of trustees in uh, next month. So um, that is the scenario that we we as a committee have selected. And you know, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. McCord, who can um, kind of take through a little bit about what, what some of the features are in scenario seven. We do have large maps on the campuses and I encourage, uh, which have a much better detail in terms of roads. That is one of our challenges. We generally have a hard time capturing that kind of road detail on these smaller maps that we use for graphics, but uh, there are some larger maps on campuses. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. McCord. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, as we look at scenario seven and we focus in on just this scenario, I'm going to slow down a little bit and I'm going to go uh, by zone by zone, but also I'm going to bring out more tonight streets, subdivisions, and areas within that zone just to try to help. Uh, uh, extend the understanding of where people would be moving potentially on scenario seven. So here we go. First off, I'll put people together and I'm going to lump it together. And the first group will be 
Austin to Creighton. So Austin to Creighton in scenario seven includes 25E, which is very centrally located and is, is the home of Forest Trace, and 27E, which is in the nucleus of the Caney Creek zone, which would include Tanglewood Farms 1 and Frank Plunk Drive. So that is a summary of going from Austin to Creighton. Next, let's talk about transitioning from Creighton to Milam. And going from Creighton to Milam, we're going to start out on the east side with 24B. And 24B would be going from Creighton to Milam, along with the following ones I'm going to mention. And 24B is composed of Bulldog Lane, Castlewood Drive, Fillmore Lane, and Jake Goodrum Road. In the same general area, 28B on the east side would also be part of this, going from Creighton to Milam. It includes... Fire Tower Acres, Tommy Smith Road, Tower Glen, and Ridge. Moving off to the west, you have 26D. 26D west, which includes Roy Harris Four Corners and South, Ter South Terry Road. 27C in the west, Crystal Creek Acres and Crater Hill Road. 27E, located a little more centrally and consisting of parts of Waukegan, Road, Lombard, Massey, Stowe, portions of FM 2090, Gentry, Cool Hollow, and Eva. 29 going to the southeast corner would be, would be composed of Twin Lakes and Tower Woods. And 30 in the far southeast corner, composed of Lost Lake and McAllister Road. So heading up north, we're going to talk about Patterson to Anderson. So going from Patterson to Anderson, would include uh, Section 13 in the northwest corner, Creekside Acres, Northridge, Settlers Crossing, Caney Heights, and Hillcrest Acres. D14 in the top left in the northwest, uh, which is composed of Stream Place and Oak Tree Drive. Likewise, going from Austin to Patterson would include 26C, and I'll come back and talk about 26 in 27A, but 26C in the west, which contains Lake Wildwood, Henry Harris Road, Champion Hills, and Masterson Lane, as well as 27A, of which Tucker and Hart Road are a part. And once again, we'll come back to that. Changing from Milam to the brand new Hope Elementary would be down south, 31C, which is Whispering Pines. 31D, which Deer Glen West and County West are part of. 33D, Pioneer Trails and Western Hill Estates. F33, Pine Meadows and Southern Pines. And off to the west, the largest section for Hope would be 34A, which is a large geographical section on the west side composed of Crystal Creek Estates, Gulf Coast Road, and Dewberry name. Specifically, if you look down at San Jacinto, San Jacinto Elementary would lose one section on its eastern border, and that would be 31B to the New, to the new Hope Elementary, and there are uh, numerous developments within that smaller area within 31B that would be a part of that, going from San Jacinto to Hope Elementary in the purple. You know, it's noteworthy if Dr. Hines will go up to the green section for 26C and 27A. And just noteworthy here is that this move, uh, 26C and 27A, the move from Austin to Patterson would transition them uh, entirely uh, from the Caney Creek zone to the Conroe High Feeder pre-K through 12. So it would, uh, that we talked about that earlier but they would be transitioning from the Candy Creek feeder to the Conroe High School feeder. We can move on to the next slide, Dr. Hines. Here's a summary, and this gives you the total number of children potentially impacted. If we can go back one slide, 982, but this breaks it down, a subdivision, and it shows you from campus to campus. And it gives you a good look uh, within the Candy Creek feeder and to uh, a, a small extent involving the Conroe High School feeder of children impacted by specific area. And moving on to the slide, 
we can look and we can see the enrollment totals. And this gives you a good look at capacity and uh, geo and also scenario seven, what we estimate it would look like. So if you look at Austin, Austin receives uh, tremendous relief, which it's going to need. Creighton gets relief, it gets it under its capacity and it would be at 641. And the crate was a 641 under all the iterations that we were able to look at uh, in the uh, in the designing of zones for Hope Elementary. Milam would be at 407, so 400. We want to be north of 400 if possible. It puts San Jacinto at 442. It puts Patterson. It gives Patterson some relief uh, from the current 907 down to 777. Hope was goes from zero to 389. And we're pretty comfortable and confident once we get everyone who's their boots on the ground, uh, transfers and such, it'll be north of 400. And then at the very end, you can see, as you look, Anderson would be at 572, which would give Anderson a few more minutes that it needs now and address multiple short-term and medium-term uh, situations under scenario seven. So if we can advance on to the next slide, Dr. Hahn. Yeah, I do want to mention about Anderson that one of the things that's Anderson's that's unique is they really do have a, a really high number of transfers there. And so um, they're going to be bigger, especially that first year. And, you know, I didn't really talk about it at the beginning, but in the next school year, in the 2021 school year, we're going to go through this process in the Conroe feeder. Uh, we're actually going to open another elementary in the – fall of 22 so the 21 22 year we'll be going through this process and there will be a chance so we'll have a we'll have a better feel out how that works out at anderson if anderson gets a little tight uh, we certainly will be planning to adjust that because this actually was something that we debated as we went through this process whether we wait a year or do it now and i think you know really having weighed the pros and cons we felt like it was in the, the best interest to start the process now since we're, 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 we're redoing this and we got to create some capacity at Austin, but uh, something we can watch, but there will be a rezoning in the Conroe um, High School feeder elementary area starting uh, next school year. So here's a summary. And uh, we talked about this, you know, Austin gets received substantial relief. Uh, San Jacinto would be smaller for now, but it is growth, much growth expected. Creighton receives help. Hope opens uh, with a with a larger population. We believe over 400, and uh, we populate Hope, the new Hope Elementary. It gives better numbers to some campuses, including including Patterson and Anderson, and it would move around 982 students for that. For the yeah, which you know, and certainly that is a big number, and we understand that. But it is one of those that is. It's just kind of what what came about as we went through this process, and, so, and at the end, all three of them had pretty high number of uh, students that had to be moved to try to achieve the goals. Here's another uh, summary, if you look, and it'll show you the numbers again at the top, and you can see in that table and see what it looks like, and number really solid. Uh, one thing worth noting: it gives you the bilingual numbers, and bilingual education very important, and one positive thing to note from this scenario is that, you know, there's no guarantee, but it looks like we would have sufficient number of students and bilingual students to maintain programs at all the schools. And we realize those programs are important. They mean a lot to people. And this scenario would allow us to have those. So that's a positive. And if you look here at the outgoing and incoming impact at the bottom, uh, the, I guess the things that stand out the biggest would be the relief you can see for Austin. You can see what it, uh, you know, it, it does for Creighton. Hope obviously goes from zero to three, four hundred ish. Uh, gets Milam. Uh, you see where we go for Milam, San Jacinto. Uh, minor impact, not too big there for them. Patterson, Anderson, and the overall total equaling out outgoing and income nine eighty two. And you know, one of the things to note about Milam is probably the outside of hope, which doesn't exist yet, <laughs> Milan is the school that gets impacted the most. And, and you, a lot of the students that currently are zoned to Milan, we're going to move over to hope. And then there are a lot of students moving from Austin, Creighton, um, and over to Milan as well. So 
that is one of the schools that really gets a lot of impact under this scenario. We and we looked at the committee looked at that and and tried to find ways to mitigate that and it just really. Uh, but we feel like out of all the plans, this one this one gives us the best balance. So thank you very much, Mr. Cord. I, I will um, just mention briefly. You know, as we went through this process too. We started thinking about well, a couple of years from now, we open an intermediate school. What might that look like? And so this is just an example of one possible map. And really, this is a map, and the green area rep represents the the Bosman area. Under this map, what we did is we we were able to kind of think of it. Well, if everybody at Austin and Creighton went to what is currently the Morehead Junior High location site for intermediate. And if everyone at San Jacinto and Hope went to uh, Granger Intermediate, and then Milam, and by its location of being very close um, to both of the schools, um, becomes almost a split. You know, about half of the students would go out of Milam and go to Grangerland, and half would go to the new intermediate. So, um, it really is a, just a, it's just not, it's not totally finished. It's not something that we've, you know, really gone through detail with, but I just want to at least give kind of an idea of what that might look like and how it might present itself in terms of uh, two different intermediates when we, when we jump to the second intermediate in that feeder. So just a few things I would, you know, just kind of share that one, we do not take the task of changing boundaries lightly. We recognize the impact that on families, um, but it is necessary when we open new schools to, in response to growth. As I shared earlier, we are committed to providing a quality educational experience at all of our schools. And we really think that this new campus is gonna be outstanding just as those other campuses are. Um, and then we do plan to make this recommendation to our board of trustees in January for their approval. We have pages up where you can uh, see more information and certainly wanted to remind folks that those are available. We've had several questions during this process. I wanna to try to respond to as uh, several of these and um, kind of share some information. We've talked about the grade levels that are impacted on this. We're only rezoning elementary, so we're looking at pre-K through grades four. Um, in one of the questions we were asked is, will we, will we be rezoning intermediate? And that is not in this and so, but we are thinking about it. That will come up in a couple of years. Um, what about special programs? And Mr. McCord alluded to that. You know, we, we think we'll have bilingual at all the schools. We think we'll have pre-K at all the schools. Uh, special education programs, it depends on the size of the program. Sometimes campuses share programs with two campuses or three campuses, send students to make one program. It depends on the program. So that one could vary. Um, basic services that are common, like would be available at all of the schools. Um, what about students that are currently in third grade finishing their last year or next year? Would they get to stay at their campus? And the answer to that is yes, but the district does not provide transportation. So um, there will be a process for uh, families that have a student entering into the fourth grade where they can um, put in a, for a transfer to stay at their, finish out their last year at their home campus. And that will include siblings. So if there's a younger sibling that wants to stay while you finish out, we don't expect parents and their children to two different campuses. So uh, we will work through that process. And that will be, that process come earlier than the, um, the normal transfer process that we have in place. Because we, we really try to get, um, because what will happen after the board approves this is we'll start the process populating these schools, which will then drive our teacher counts and who's going to, what our staff, like at different schools. So we'll have to move some teachers uh, to, to the new school and the numbers of students will kind of determine um, who's coming. And so this process is, uh, we we'll want to do those transfers a little bit faster than normal. So we'll kind of know how much, what our numbers are going to look like at our schools. Don't move someone only to move them back. Um, so we will do that. And that will be, uh, generally, I think, Dr. Phillips, we do that in usually like March, I think. That's usually a March present. And then, you know, we had the question, who actually decides which scenario will be selected? Well, and we talked about it. The Boundary Committee has been working on this, and they're the one that selects the scenario and works on the scenarios, and they will make the recommendation, and it'll be the school board that actually officially adopts uh, this new uh, boundary. And again, that's our game plan for that is January. 
and are these uh, subject to change? And you know, the answer to that is uh, hopefully not. Uh, hopefully, we think we get, we have what we want to do. It doesn't rule out um, if there's some kind of minor tweak that needs to be corrected um, that could take place. Um, but hopefully, it's not some significant that we haven't shown you. So uh, it's either if it's not current or it's not something we've looked at. Um, I don't see anything changing, but you know, I learned a long time ago, we might find the street, we have it on the map wrong or, um, you know, but it's, it wouldn't be anything major. It might be one street that we missed or uh, that we need to correct. Sometimes we have problems where we, we draw a line and there's, there's two sides of the street and we wanted both sides to go to the same school. And so we, we fix that. And sometimes we don't, we'll use a major road like, uh, 3083, you'll see on the maps, for example, um, people could live right across the street, 383, and one's going to go to one school, one's going to go to the other. Um, very close to the school, will I be rezoned? Um, and again, that's, it's always possible. We try to keep, if you're really, real close to a school, we try not to rezone you. In, in this case, you saw on the map, there's some uh, neighborhoods that are a lot closer to Austin than they are to Creek. Uh, they're not that far from Creighton, relatively speaking, but they are uh, certainly further where they currently are in relation to Austin, and they get moved. So um, we, we do know in the result of this, there's some some neighbors that got moved a little bit further, um, but there are some that got moved closer. And so, um, but if, if they're real close to school, we certainly try not, not to move you away from your campus. Uh, in the case of Milam and Hope, uh, they're both very close geographically, and so we're going to be families that live very close to both schools. And so either way, they're going to be at one of those two schools. Uh, I mentioned about bus travel. Uh, sometimes could be improved, some could not. So it'll be from, from community to community. Um, how likely is it that I'm going to be known in the near future? Well, it is possible. As I mentioned earlier, we try not to keep moving the same folks around. Um, but we do know there will be another elementary coming in the next three or four years. And so we will go through this process. In, and certainly we will be mindful of what we just did when we do that process, but um, there, it will occur again. Uh, my child received speech therapy. If I'm known, will that, they still receive that service? The answer is yes. Uh, and then what happens next? And I, I kind of alluded to that. What will happen um, once, once January and we approve this and it's full, we'll, we'll send out a letter notifying of what the decision is. There will start to be some communication in the spring about, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have a new principal. Um, we'll get decided early spring, early in the second semester. We'll name a new principal. Um, we're filling up the staff. Once we get a principal hired and we get some folks that we know they're gonna be working there, communicating about meetings or uh, orientations to kind of welcome people. Uh, I know they'll start a process trying to to develop the mascot. So there's, there's a lot of things that will happen for us. You know, it's kind of in steps. So the first thing that we're trying to do is who's going to go there, which will decide how many students, which then we'll start, we'll start figuring out the staffing for it. And that will, there'll be some other processes that begin along the way. And then we'll start communicating about the new school. So once you'll, you will see we now in May, um, it'll start to take a voice and it, you'll hear if you're zoned to hope or to hear from, from folks about your new school. And I just want to say thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if Dr. Phillips or Mr. McCord, if there's anything you want to add before we sign off. No, just a, a thank you to the committee for all of your work. It was a, a long time coming to here and they did a great job. They did. Outstanding job. I'll second Dr. Phillips. Thanks to everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.